On the morning of 24th November 1861, one of the most tragic events in Edinburgh took place a few minutes after one o'clock that Sunday morning. The densely populated tenement at 109 High Street collapsed. Situated on the north side of the street, it stood between Bailey Fife's Close on the east and was joined at the back on the east side by the gable of another land, which extended down Hazley's Close. The ground floor, fronting the high street, was occupied by the shops of Mr Cairns, a grocer at No. 99, and Brown & Company, victual dealers, at No. 103, while Mr Moyer, an ironmonger, and Mr McCluskey, a shoe merchant, occupied the first floor. The remainder of the six-storey building, although seven at the back, including attics, was occupied by working men and their families, many of them poor. Altogether, it was believed around 80 or 90 people lived there. The majority had been in bed, but a number of young men and women hadn't been at home at the time, so escaped. Sergeant Rennie, on night duty, was passing down High Street and had got as far as the front of Cairn's shop a few minutes after one o'clock when he heard a scuffle in Skinner's Close opposite. He immediately ran across the street and was followed by a number of people who were standing near the Close heads, leaving the north side of the street empty. The scuffle turned out to be an argument between a man and his wife. Once things calmed, Rennie was returning up the close along with another officer when they heard a loud noise. They watched as the tenement fell, crashing to the ground, with plumes of dust being thrown into the air. As it cleared, a gaping hole around 30 yards wide became visible. The whole building had fallen straight down, except the front wall, which fell outwards. Only the back wall, partly supported by the back land, and two gables connected to adjoining houses, were left standing. The walls left showed fires burning, the fireplaces left standing, as well as the press recesses in the walls, with all their contents exposed in the moonlight. Instantly, wailing rose from the ruins and cries of mother, mother from young children, but most of the rubble and debris was silent. In a few minutes, the street was teeming with people, asking what had happened, and the rudely awakened occupants of the surrounding houses opened their windows. They then poured into the street. In a short time, the fire brigade and a large detachment of police officers arrived. The Lord Provost, Francis Brown Douglas, and magistrates, the sheriff, the members of the Dean of Guild Court, Mr McPherson, the superintendent of streets and buildings, Robert Dimmock, the procurator fiscal, Dr Littlejohn, the police surgeon, and others were all informed. All of them, as well as many members of the town council, arrived quickly at the scene. By two o'clock the street was full and barricades were placed above and below the ruined building. The firemen, reinforced by numerous labourers who volunteered, were formed into teams by Mr Mitchell and immediately began searching for survivors. The night was calm but frosty and the moon shone down on the appalling scene. There wasn't enough light, however, for working and a number of flambeaux were brought in from the police office while the jets and globes were removed from the street lamps to give as much light as possible to the workers. The parts of the ruins from where the cries had been heard were removed first. 
Around 22 men, women and children were still alive, but nearly all of them injured and were extricated. Around 14 were taken to the Royal Infirmary, and the remainder, mostly children, who had fortunately escaped with a few bruises, were wrapped in any coverings that could be found, then taken to the police office. The fire brigade was then directed to retrieve the dead bodies. Wooden beams, smashed furniture and stones were piled on the street. It was hard and dangerous work, as the gable walls and back wall, though standing, were cracked and broken and were in danger of falling at any moment. The western part of the back wall especially, which had no support, was most precarious of all. At the police office, large numbers of people who either had relations or friends who lived at the tenement gathered, asking for information. Bodies were laid out in a room at the police office. At one side was the body of a woman with her infant daughter beside her, while at the other lay an aged woman whose face had been disfigured. Between them were seven or eight bodies, the features of some of which were so disfigured that identification was difficult, while others looked little different from what they looked like in life. On a table was the body of a tall, stout, middle-aged man, his face totally discoloured and slightly bruised, readied for identification, while in an adjoining room the bodies of a man, woman and child were found among the ruins, were lying beside each other in the same order they had been found in their beds. Another body, that of a man, showed he died from suffocation rather than injury, as had a child. In another room at the station was nearly all of those who'd been rescued uninjured from the ruin, mainly children. They were all lying down in their night clothes, but none could sleep. Their cries were heard throughout the station, the emotional pain of one little boy in particular, who lost both his parents in the disaster, being most upsetting. In the course of the afternoon, The children were moved to the houses of friends or to some of the charitable institutions in the city. The following morning, the firefighters and labourers were mustered at six, but due to the light and strength of the wind, nothing was done until eight o'clock, when a strong rope was thrown over the back wall, which was pulled down for safety with the front coming tumbling down, leaving the other part apparently as strong as ever. It was now about half past two, and as there seemed little danger of that coming down, the search work resumed. The efforts of the men were mainly directed to the upper or western side of the building. Shortly after work began, they came across two loaves of bread and other provisions. Digging nearby, they found a mattress, then a short distance away they came across the bodies of two women, one of them between 60 and 70, the other a girl of about 15. At the police office, the older woman was identified as Mrs Mackay, who lived in the fifth floor of the tenement, and whose daughter's body was dug out on Sunday. The girl was identified as Johan Sutherland, who was Mrs Mackay's granddaughter, and lived with her. About half an hour later, two other bodies were discovered. They were again those of two women, one about 50, the other 18. A little boy was pulled out by firemen after about five hours of digging, and he was heard calling out repeatedly, Heave away, my lads, I'm no dead yet. After dark, the search continued using torches, 
several of which were held by medical students who volunteered. The work was carried on without a break, and just before three o'clock, two more bodies were discovered. The first dugout was a man aged around 40, found under a mattress and bed tick, and beside him was a wallet containing £24 and an envelope addressed to Mr William McCluskey. He was the shoe merchant who lived with his wife in the house behind their shop on the second floor. Mrs McCluskey was among those in the infirmary, with her leg and back bruised. The other body was that of a woman about twenty or twenty-five. Beside her was found three letters, all of them dated at Helensborough, and two of them signed Janet Bannerman, and the other Kate Bannerman. John Bruce and Mrs Beveridge, who'd been rescued, died in the Royal Infirmary on the Sunday. Mr Dimmock, the Procurator Fiscal, investigated the circumstances of the accident, and many witnesses were questioned about who occupied the houses in the tenement. On the third floor lived Alexander MacDonald, a compositor, and his wife Catherine. William Hepburn, aged 40, a porter, and brother to Mrs MacDonald. Isabella and Anne MacDonald, aged 23 and 18 respectively. Donald MacDonald, aged 16, and John and William MacDonald, aged 12 and 7. Of these eight, six were saved, but the two youngest boys perished. Immediately before the fall of the tenement, Catherine and two daughters were in bed in the kitchen, while Alexander and the two youngest boys, John and William, were in a room, and Donald and his uncle were in bed in a spare room. Isabella had just gone to bed, and hearing a sudden loud cracking noise, jumped up and cried out, Oh mother, I think the house is falling. I heard a crack like sticks burning. Mrs MacDonald and two girls immediately jumped out of bed and roused the house. Alexander ran into the kitchen to see what was wrong, leaving the two younger boys in bed. As the house began to shake under their feet, all members of the family rushed naked to the door to escape, leaving the eldest son to try and rescue the two boys in their bed. As he was about to enter the room, however, he had to jump to the landing from the passage on the staircase, but the ground gave way under him. In the same passage with the MacDonalds lived William Black and his two sons, James and Robert, in one large room. Robert was out of the house at the time of the incident, and father and son ran out of the house on hearing the cracking noise and survived. Another house on this floor was occupied by Mrs Mackay and her daughter Isabella and two police constables who lodged in the house. Both mother and daughter died, but the constables escaped having been on night shift. Charles Black, a maltster, also occupied a house on this floor. On the fourth floor lived William Baxter, a butcher, and his family, all of whom escaped. Also on this floor lived a man named Gunn and his wife and three children, Jane, aged 20, John, 18, and Mary, 9. Only the youngest was saved. A porter called Irvin also lived on this floor with his wife, an older relative named Mrs McCarricker, and four children. A baby aged six weeks, Agnes, 22 months old, Mary, aged six, and Alexander, aged eight. All died except Alexander, who was uninjured. The only other occupants of this floor were 90-year-old Mrs Mackay 
Alexander Mackay, her son, aged 60, a tailor, and a grandchild, Johan Sutherland, aged 15, all of whom were killed. The last bodies to be extricated were those of David Skirving and his wife and daughter. The daughter was the first of the three discovered, her body slipping down from a corner of the building when some wooden beams were being removed. Skirving and his wife were found about five feet below the surface of the street. The family had resided on the second floor, in the corner of the building, and was last to be cleared. The walls of their house were visible after the clearance, and a large coloured print of Queen Victoria still hung on the chimney piece. The story of the escape made by the Baxter family on the fourth floor was nothing short of miraculous. Baxter himself had reached home from his work about midnight when his wife and nine children were all in bed. He took a small piece of bread and butter for supper and was undressing to go to bed and had placed his trousers on the back of his chair when he was startled by hearing a rattling noise. His wife said to him, there's a warning, referring to warnings before death, and she had scarcely uttered the words when his daughter Mary, a young woman aged about twenty, called from the room where she was sleeping with three of her sisters, father, father, mother, mother. Baxter rushed into the room, followed by his wife, and to his horror found that the bed where his four daughters lay was in two halves. He called his children and drove them and his wife almost completely naked along the passage and into the common stair behind the house, which they reached not a moment too soon, for the husband who came last had to leap for his life over a chasm which formed between the falling house and the staircase. In another case, a young man named Adams who was in one of the rooms on the fifth floor, was carried down by the falling wall and deposited on the pavement on the opposite side of the street, but he only suffered slight bruising. In all, 35 bodies were recovered, with 32 people escaping or being rescued. The excavations were continued until Friday night, when the foundations of the house were laid bare, about 18 feet below the level of the street. The cause of the disaster was soon discovered. There was a concealed stone wall, three feet thick, which ran parallel to the front and back walls in the middle of the huge building, but it wasn't tied in to either of the gables. It was found that on the west side it had been undermined to make way for a boiler, the heat from which had helped to crumble the thin, remaining part of the wall. The boiler had been there for many years, but had been little used prior to the collapse. The wall was further weakened by hollowing out a chimney for the boiler and by erecting a door. On the east side, the wall of the shop floor had been partly removed in 1814 to open it up. Only two pillars of wall were left to support it, and this wall was not only left undermined, but was also rotten. It not only fell, but shattered, with a single large fragment remaining. The timbers were also rotten with age. Six days after the collapse, a cat and dog were found alive, but emaciated. Some other animals dug from the ruins, including two birds taken down from the walls in their cages, were sold for considerable sums of money. In one instance, a gentleman gave £20 for a little mongrel, previously not worth a penny. A relief fund was set up for the survivors, with donations in that first week amounting to between £1,200 and £1,500. 
Like most of the houses in that part of the old town of Edinburgh, the collapsed building was believed to have been one of the old wooden houses dating from the 16th century, masked by a more modern stone front. It also transpired that on Saturday afternoon, one of the shop owners noticed a slight break in the plaster and a deflection of the roof, and immediately sent for a builder to examine the structure. A temporary prop was inserted, and after examining the upper stories of the houses, the builder concluded that the flaw was merely a local one, and no further steps were taken. Within 12 hours, it was a pile of rubble. If you enjoyed this episode of Scotland's History, please like, comment and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching.